You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. If you're still on the hunt for a sports book to call home, bet the nonstop action of March Madness with my bookie. Enter bracket contests for a chance to take home prizes of up to $25,000 or pick from a huge selection of straight bets, props, and odds boosts. Whatever your style, MyBookie makes it easy to play your way and get paid. Sign up now and take advantage of our generous welcome offer to score a massive first deposit bonus of up to $1,000. All you have to do is claim promo code MADNESS50. But the fun doesn't stop there. Get up to the minute odds, free bets, and expert predictions to help you decide who to put your money on. The best part about MyBookie? You can bet on anything, anytime, from anywhere. Use promo code MADNESS50, that's MADNESS50, to secure your limited time welcome bonus today. It's only a kick. A jump. A block. It's only a serve. It's only a tackle, a run. It's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. Actually, it's the it's the lead play in our in our offense. Yes, a Y end or a tight end to open up somewhere between six feet and nine feet. Get an isolation with the with the linebacker. Tell the tackle to take the defensive end if he's over and if he's not, to drive down on the first man to his inside. If the YN has the linebacker taken out, he cuts inside. If the YN has the linebacker in, he comes all the way around. If you look at this play where we're trying to get a seal here, and a seal here, and try to run this play in the alley. What's up, guys? Welcome into Packers Total Access. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. Find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. Email us, Packers Total Access at gmail.com. Text us, 865-658-5824. Join alongside Tim, live in Green Bay. If I had to venture to guess, Tim, you're probably happy to be here tonight, ain't you, big dog? I'm very happy to be here, yes. Yes. <laughs> Seems like that's always the answer we get, man. It's good to see you, bud. Uh, good to see you, too, man. How was your day, Clay? Oh, it was great, man. We got out and uh, planted a couple of trees on the property. Got us a cherry, uh, what's that, cherry willow planted. So it's going to look good with the weeping willows. And, uh, man, it was just a gorgeous day. 15-mile-an-hour wind, about 70 degrees. It was just, I mean, perfect, man, absolutely. Perfect. Rainy and cold here in Wisconsin. What are you going to do? <laughs> I keep telling everybody, it's it's going to catch up. You guys are you guys are going to get it. It's on its way, man. We'll get so, there. Just hold out, man. Hold out just a little bit longer. Um, I know the chat's already on fire in here. Good to see everybody. We got Josh in the house, Greg, Mark Zambito, Margin Cron uh, in here talking about his ice venti mocha. That's what I'm talking about. We got United Bates in the house. We got Coach Lynn. I like this one right here. Got the cowboy hat emoji. Welcome to the chat, Coach Lynn. Appreciate you, bud. Uh, M. Smitty, do you rant? Do you rant? New posse member checking in tonight. New member of the PTA posse over at Patreon. Good to have you in here, bud. Uh, we got John Capel in the house. We've got Joe G. We got Mark, Doug Pointer, everybody, man. Good to see everybody. So Turtles back in the house, too. So, um, yeah, there we go. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I wonder where Eric is. I wonder where Eric Sutherland is. It's been a minute. Yeah, where's Uncle Eric? I hope he's doing all right. Probably in the clink somewhere. You never know about that guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> he, he might be waiting on bail. So, hey, uh, hey, 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 that's just the way we talk in the clink. <laughs> Got Andy Monday in the house as well, man. Good to see everybody. Uh, let's do this, Tim. Let's get it kicked off right. So there was a little bit going on um, the last few days, Tim. Obviously, I went live midday today. It was really cool, man. Had like over 200 people in here watching. We just did a quick mock. Um, you know, my – my mock got lost in the shuffle somehow, some way um, when we did our, our early mocks. And we're going to do another one right before the draft game. Um, but obviously we hit on uh, the mocks from Emilio, um, Jacob, Tim, and Carly Ray. And we've got those kind of filed away. 
And then we've got my mock now. So we'll kind of recap the mock that I did earlier. And I want to get your take on it, Tim, see how you feel. Um, I feel like overall the chat was – they were happy with it, you know. Um, there was a couple times I was faced with some real tough decisions, man. I was struggling. I was just like, mm -hmm. cornerback is the big thing, Tim. It keeps popping up. If you don't take a corner with that number 25 pick, you find yourself kind of – kind of wandering in the in the wilderness, if you will, until, you know, a little bit later in the draft. It just seems like number 25 makes the most sense with Kool-Aid McKinstry, if indeed he is on the board. But if you wait beyond that, man, whew, you find yourself in a little bit of a pickle. So uh, It's so true, Clayton. You know, when you, you talked about, um, you know, bringing up your draft and kind of going over your draft from earlier today, um, it made me think of, uh, of mine. And you, as you just mentioned with corner. Mm-hmm. There are things about my draft that what has it been two weeks, three weeks since we did did this one? Yeah. There's things about my draft that I absolutely love. And then there's things that I don't love, which is, you know, my 88th, 91st. <laughs> right. And um, you know, you talk about taking a corner. It's like you're either gonna go early or you're gonna be picking from the DJ Jameses and the Johnny Dixons. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and not a knock on Max Melton, but yes, Max Melton, Max Melton could be on the board at, you know, 115 for all we know, 125. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, it's crazy how much, uh, you know, a week of time can, can make such a huge difference. Right. Yeah. I mean, when you really evaluate things, I think you're absolutely right about corner in this draft. Looking forward to seeing what you got. Yeah. Absolutely. Coach Lynn kind of agrees. He said corner has to be picked up early or they'll get snatched up quick. Um, it's crazy, too, because they're they're seeing this draft as a corner heavy draft. And there's two ways of thinking about it. Like you can you can look at it like, OK, go grab one of those, you know, top top tier corners early in the first round. But I kind of feel like Goody might be looking at it like this is anytime he says we're deep at a position in the draft he tends to wait until outside of the first round. Like last year, he talked about how deep the tight end draft was, right? And what did he do? He used the second and I think the third round, right? Yeah. So kind of makes you think he wants everybody to kind of get some of the noise out of the way, and then he can pick from what's left because he feels like it's that deep. But then again, it is line season, right? Everybody's trying to send these smoke signals. So uh, smoke screens, sure. I feel say. So, yeah, there you go, man. Um Andy Monday in the chat said Packers released their offseason practice dates this week. Yeah, we uh, actually hit on that last night, Andy. It's, uh, it's pretty cool, man. We already got that info out there and uh, excited that pretty much every month this offseason we got something going on with the Packers. So we're going to have plenty to talk about. There's no doubt about that. Championship um, offseason, like Preston Smith said, right? <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, so, yeah, So Turtles says that's a W mock right there, talking about your mock there, Tim. Um, I've actually got – let me try to pull it all up. It may be a little bit harder to read here. But you guys can see the names at the bottom of each mock there. So uh, the mock that he's talking about, obviously, is Tim's uh, there on the far right. Uh, Jackson Powers Johnson, uh, center out of Oregon at the 25 spot. Tyler Newbin, safety out of Minnesota at 41. Junior Colson, linebacker from Michigan at 58. Max Melton at 88. I would love Max Melton at that spot. I think that feels really good right there. Um, out of Rutgers, obviously cornerback. He went and got DJ James again, went back to back there at 91, got him um, out of Auburn. You got tackle Christian Jones, which is starting to pick up a little steam. I've noticed that here lately out of Texas. Got him in the fourth round at 126. And then at 169, you got edge defender Braden McGregor. That's one position I did not hit in my mock draft was edge. Um, 202, you went halfback Frank Gore Jr. Uh, 219, you went uh, cornerback Johnny Dixon. 245, you went safety Kenny Logan Jr. And then at 255, you went linebacker Jordan McGee. Got a grade of B. Uh, your overall grade of that draft was a B. I think it should be much higher than that, obviously. Uh, when you look at Junior Colson, that brung your grade down. He's my best linebacker in this draft. Um, and DJ James, that, that yeah. gave D plus at 91. That was I'm, a reach for sure. Um, but, the DJ oh James pick was a reach. On my board, it really isn't though, Tim. Um, definitely on what the the database we use, but uh, on my board, I've got him at sixty seven. I'd be jumping over the freaking moon taking yeah. DJ James at that spot. So it just all depends on what what website you're using and, and everybody's personal preference and all that. So um, it's really but, telling though, because I my, my favorite part of the draft of of mine were the first three picks. I feel like I smacked those out of the park. Yeah, and absolutely. it's like, but then it's like, oh man. 
double dip at corner right now while you can. Mm-hmm. It's so it it is. I would not want Goody's job. I wouldn't. I mean, yeah. the guy's, you know, I, I, I hope his uh, physical training regimen is on point, man, because the guy's blood pressure has got to be through the roof during this time of year right now trying to make these decisions. No, you absolutely know it, man. There's no doubt about that. Um, yeah, so that's what So Turtles was talking about. That's a W mock right there. I completely agree, bub. Um, let's see what else we got here in the chat real quick. Yeah, Mark Zambito, love those picks. Um, right here, uh, Coach Lynn says, might end up reaching if you draft corner after 25. That's probably what it comes down to. You can get great value at 25, or you have to reach a touch if you wait till later. At least it seems that way. Um, there you go. So uh, let's see what else we got here. Joe G, did anyone watch the UFL today? I actually did, Joe. I thought it was I thought it was fun, man. I enjoyed it. It was nice seeing football on. I wish they played a little more outdoors. Obviously, the first game was outdoors. It was in Arlington, but I think the second game is played in Detroit. So I'm I'm not big on the indoor football. I don't know how you feel about that, Tim. I, I want it out there in the elements, man. Absolutely. On grass, natural surface. Come on now. I'm a yeah. purist, just like you, Clayton, for sure. Yeah, definitely, man. Um, let's see here. Doug Pointer says it's a step draft, a, f- a few A players, a bunch of B players, and a crowd of C players at cornerback. You have to lead with your best card at this position. It kind of goes goes for all the positions, really. You know, when you think about it, you got to what do you prioritize, and what's the biggest need? What's the current tier of talent look on the horizontal board, and uh, make sure you choose wisely, right? Uh, David James in the chat says I need DJ James. LOL. Oh, there you go. Got to have it, man. Got to have it. Um, Andy Monday said he likes those picks with the coaching staff should gel really well there. According to Andy, Andy Monday. And then Prince in the chat said choice at number 25 may come down to a falling cornerback versus a falling defensive tackle. If projections of, uh, number of offensive tackles, quarterbacks and wide receivers slated for the first round is close. It's a good point, man. It Mm -hmm. kind of depends on which position is going to fall further. Right. Um, that's kind of how that's going to lay out there. Uh, here's the mock I did earlier, Tim. And it's funny, uh, I think me and Emilio are the only one that took Jerzon Newton, but Jerzon Newton fell to me as well. Um, I took him with the 25th pick. Again, I had him um, as the top defensive lineman in the draft. I had him at the number 14 spot. I just couldn't pass up on it. It came down to him, and there was one other player that was right there too. I'm trying to think of who it was. I think it was Jackson Powers Johnson maybe at 21. And Jerzon Newton was just just too much value to pass up on. Now, listen, that doesn't mean he's a slam dunk. There's no slam dunks in the NFL draft. I don't care what anyone says. Now, you got players that grade out significantly higher that you think, okay, you've got a, uh, less of a chance of them busting out, right? Um, but there's no there's no guarantees with the draft, but you just got to kind of stick to the board. And, you know, the the truth is Goody, Goody may not even like Jerzon Newton. You know, we don't know. We don't know what his board looks like. I know that's kind of a boring commentary, but I just – I'm not going to be one of those guys to to stand on the stand on my chair and, and you know on the desk and be like my board is the best you know like you <laughs> we're, we're going to find out what these uh, these front offices really think about each and every one of these players as we go but um, I took Jerzon Newton at 25 defensive lineman out of Illinois then I took Tyler Newbin at 41 safety out of Minnesota that will be your box safety um, with the 58th pick there in the second round I took guard Christian Haynes so there's your starting right guard. Um, at 88, I ended up going linebacker Jeremiah, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. from Clemson. So that will be your most likely your linebacker starting alongside Quay Walker. Um, then I went DJ James out of Auburn at 91. So there's a outside corner to compete with Eric Stokes, Corey Ballantyne, and Carrington Ballantyne for that corner opposite of Jair Alexander, obviously. Keyshawn Nixon – Going to be your starting slot. I think we all kind of agree with that based off of the fact that they gave him $6 million per. They're looking at good value there for a slot corner. Um, they said that Halfley really liked the tape on him when he came in. That was one of the first things it sounds like he really evaluated and was like, yeah, that's who I want as my slot corner. Now, that doesn't mean that if the best slot corner in the draft, <clears throat> Cooper DeGene falls, right, <laughs> that he ain't going to take him. That, that opinion right. can change quick. If we learned anything about Aaron Jones, Tim, Opinions oh, yeah. can be really quick, right? That's right. And it also it doesn't matter where you're drafted. If you yeah. can get in the league and perform when you're when you're starting job and, and have a great year, hey, more power to you. It doesn't matter where you're drafted. 
Yep, absolutely. I took Cedric Gray with 126 out of North Carolina. He's a linebacker, so that would be the guy competing with Isaiah McDuffie, Christian Welch, and uh, and our boy Eric Wilson for that that third and final four three linebacker, right? In our just our base defense that we'd be facing 11, 12, or I'm sorry, 12, 21, and 13 personnel most likely with. This is the new one for me, Tyrone Tracy, running back out of Purdue. He's just someone that I just recently stumbled across, started studying a little bit on him, went and looked at some of the tape, looked at all the grades and everything. Um, Greg Cosell raved about him as well. That's one of his sleeper guys in this draft. When Greg Cosell kind of stands on the table for someone, I'm telling you, he did it for Dontavian Wicks, and and I remember it like it was yesterday. I was like, holy cow, man. He hit on all year long when Dontavian Wicks was just juking people. When he was running routes and juking people out of their jock, I, all I can hear – is Greg Cosell saying this guy, this kid gets it. This kid gets it, right? Because he's just a technician in his crap. Saying that about Tyrone Tracy, Tyrone Tracy has played receiver in the past. He was a running back this past year, really stood out. Um, he's one of those that's average draft position somewhere around 170. But according to the PFF big board, um, I think he's somewhere right around 100, 110. So um, really good value there for us at 169 in the fifth round. I feel like that's going to give you a receiving threat at halfback if we do go that route. So now you've got Josh Jacobs, who's a pretty versatile back. He can he can catch the ball well. He can also run with power. He's got the agility, the speed to run outside if you want to go outside zone. A.J. Dillon is your, is your big back, right, your power back. Uh, Emmanuel Wilson's kind of that tweener, and then you go and get a Tyrone Tracy. Now you've got your receiving back, right? Your little your scat back, if you will. Um, and the sixth round at 202, I took tackle Ethan Driscoll. Um, and uh, round six, also at 219, I took tackle Andrew Coker from TCU. Uh, Ethan Driscoll, by the way, is from Marshall. Um, and then at 245, I looked up, and there's Trayvon Wallace, best on the board. Um, obviously, he's within the top 100 according to the 33rd team. Now, he's significantly lower on my board, but was still a great pick there at 245. That's a, yeah, that's a really good pick. Yeah, so that gives you a little bit of depth at the linebacker position and also some some guys to help with that linebacker room as far as special teams goes, kick return, things like that. And then with the final pick of the draft, 255, or our draft, I should say, I took Kenny Logan Jr., safety out of Kansas, who actually played a significant amount of snaps in the box as well as the slot. So he kind of gives you a little bit of a – a safety net there in the slot corner position as well as that fourth or fifth safety on your roster. So that's kind of how that all uh, shook out for me. Um, yeah, there's something I was going to hit on here. I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, oh, I was going to just really quick rattle off where these guys hit on my draft board, okay? Um, again, Jerzon Newton with the first pick. He's 14th on my board. We got him at 25. Tyler Newbin, we got him at 41. On my board, Tyler Newbin – was in the 28 spot. So we got him at 41. He was 28 on my board. Christian Haynes, guard out of Connecticut, with the 58 spot. On my board, I had Christian Haynes as the best guard. And, and understand, some people are going to say Graham Barton's a guard. Some are going to say he's a tackle. Some are trying to push him into that center position because his RAS now skyrockets to uh, an elite status. But Christian Haynes, according to my board, is the top guard. He was 30th overall. Right. So, again, 30th overall at the 58 spot. Great value there. Um, then you go on to Jeremiah Trotter, Jr. I've got him 75 on my board. We got him at 88. Great value. DJ James at 91. I have him at 67. So great value there. Cedric Gray, linebacker. I've got him in the 66 spot. Tim, we got him at 126. I mean, He's one of those guys that that he he continues to kind of bounce around a little bit. Some people's got him sinking on the boards. Other people still got him holding steady. I've got him in the 66 spot. So, um, and then Tyrone Tracy, of course, just outside of the top 100. Um, I think on uh, on the 33rd team, we got him at 169. So, just want to kind of draw a parallel there. We got basically one, two, three, four, five, six guys within my top 100 on my board. I felt really good about that. So, um, that's how that mock shook out we're going to keep that all in the i like uh, that clayton i think it turned out pretty good man again the the thing the reason we do this guys it's not hey we're bored let's do a mock draft it's you try to learn something each time and the big takeaway is what we just opened the show with man if you don't take a corner with 25 you're kind of in no man's land you've seen i couldn't i couldn't make it work with with the horizontal board until we got all the way to pick 91 Right. 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 I think you made it work with pick 88, didn't you? So it's right around that same time frame or same spot. If you're not going 25, right? 
Yeah, right. absolutely. Maybe so it's like it, maybe the next mock we do, it's like let's just strategically do that on purpose. Let's let's yeah. pick corner. Let's uh, you know take who's on the board there, and then see how the rest of the draft shakes up. But I think you did a great job. I feel like you had a little bit more. I had some notes here. I feel like like compared to like the draft from mine that we put up. I mean, you addressed offensive line way more than I did, and mm-hmm. uh, that's clearly a you know an area that we we need to address. And then um, I feel like you did the same thing with D line. I didn't take any D linemen in my draft. You went and got you know arguably the best in uh, in this draft class. So um, you know, I think it's great, man. Looks good. I feel like you uh, you covered a lot of needs, and then it was also kind of like best available when you needed to. I mean, yeah, and that's looks good. That was really the story with the defensive lineman. You know, you, if you look up, if if there's anyone out there that says we don't need to take a defensive lineman, I can't disagree with it. Like, when you look at the defensive lineman, Kenny Clark, $27 million against the cap. Devontae Wyatt, third-year, first-round pick, right? Um, Carl Brooks really flashed last year. Um, you've got uh, – who's there's one more, too, on the back side there. Gosh, who was it? Uh, well, let's just say that that's three deep right there. In a 4-3 defense, you're only playing two of those interior guys. So you've already got your starting two, whether it's Carl Brooks and Devontae Wyatt starting alongside Kenny. It doesn't matter which one you pick. You've got you've already got a solid backup there. So I can understand why people would be hesitant on taking a defensive lineman. I just looked up and said, hold up, we're getting a borderline top 10 talent here at 25. I just couldn't pass it. I feel like Ted Thompson would – yeah. Check me down and slap me in the back of the head if you passed up on the arguably the best, arguably the best defensive lineman in the draft. So, um, and like Coach Lynn said in the chat when we were doing that earlier, he was like, "Man, you can build the trenches out, build, keep building the trenches, whether it's on offense or defense. Best available, build those trenches out. It's so important, man. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, let's see what else we got here, real quick. I think we're pretty well caught up um, with the chat." Um, yeah, appreciate everybody swinging through, man. We got a bunch of people in there, about 168 watching. Thank you all for swinging through. Um, let's do this, Tim. Graham Barton has been kind of the, the big talk here of lately. I think it was a couple days ago he had his pro day. 33rd team tweeted this out and said, Graham Barton's athleticism is impressive. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's us days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperrice.com. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. He's our number two offensive guard in the draft. So you see they're establishing him as a guard, right? Now, this was what was really cool. He decided – and people are going to roll their eyes at this, but I think I think it was a statement. He did his workout with his shirt off, right? He was like, oh, I got nothing to hide. I want you to huh? – <laughs> I want you to look at this dude right here, man. We're going to play the video. We're going to show the uh, the shuttle, and then we got the three cone, okay? Look at this cat. Look how lean he looks, man. That is a big old boy right there. And then, of course, you got the three cone. Look at the agility, right? I think this is the three cone, if I remember correct. Yeah. Look at my man, dude. Wow. Yeah. He. You know who he reminds me of, honestly? And I don't I, – I'm not saying he's going to be a Hall of Fame offensive line. He could be. But just the way he's built and the way he moves kind of reminded me of Joe Thomas. Joe mm-hmm. Thomas, Wisconsin, back in the day, obviously went on to play for the 
crappy Cleveland Browns and still somehow, some way made it to the Hall of Fame. <laughs> you talk about a resume right there, Tim. Someone who plays for the Cleveland Browns and, and makes it into the Hall of Fame. That's saying something right there. But Graham Barton, man, looking like the real deal, dude. And again, it we you know how I feel about these workouts. It's not everything, but when you've got someone who's established themselves in the draft. They're on everyone's board. They seem to be holding steady. They come out and work out. You can see this dude's looking lean. Um, his RES is it would probably be through the roof for what he did, right? And uh, there was actually someone who added his RES in as a center because, you know, that's the other thing too. Versatility checks the box too, man. He can play on all five positions on the offensive line. Tackle isn't ideal, although if I understood correctly, he played left tackle the majority of the time last year, I believe. So his arm length is a little short for a tackle, but look at this right here, man. Someone put him into the database as a center. It was uh, at Notions of Nick's uh, Notions of Nick on Twitter. Said Graham Barton has the exact measurables, uh, position versatility, and pedigree that Brian Gutekunst looks for in a player, LOL. Look at him as a center. Um, 6'5", 313. That's elite composite size grade for a center. 40-yard dash, 4.94. That gives him an RAS of 9.78 there. And then that composite agility grade, man. Short shuttle, 454. And then that three cone, 731, puts him in elite status there for a composite agility grade. So, you know, I don't know what he would do with the vertical and the broad. I'm guessing he didn't do that stuff because I looked on RAS's website and it's still not in. But this just shows you it kind of goes to, it kind of goes hand in hand, Tim, with what people were saying about uh, Zach Tom. Really good right tackle. Pro Bowl caliber guard, all pro center, right? Probably going to get something similar with a Graham Barton if he doesn't bust out. But what do you think about uh about that, man? And and if you did draft him and Goody just made the decision, hey, we're just going to put him at center, and then you got a Christian Haynes a little later in the draft, and bang, you're, you're top 10 offense. Dude, it's set to, to go top five this year, man. That, that RAS score really makes you have to, you know, jot this down, make a note. So you're not putting your hands on your face in shock if if he becomes a Packer. I think it's a certainly a stronger possibility now with uh, the measurables and then the high RAS. We know we know how Goody likes them, and uh, we talked about shoring up interior offensive line. You know, as much as we talk about you know figuring out you know tackle and you know whether or not we believe uh, Rasheed Walker is the the future at left tackle, you still need another tackle. Um, on this offensive line, but I think the interior is really where we need to uh, address things sooner than later. And Graham Barton is a monster, man. So I I would not be shocked at all. I mean, he could, if he's on the board at 25, I mean, I, I don't rule that out. I mean, I took JPJ, you know, as a center. It's like, if we, if we address center, I feel like that's a huge, that gives you more flexibility with the guys that are flexible. Yeah. You've got a Zach Tom, you've got Elton Jenkins, guys that can move around. You bring in some, you know, high tier draft pick rookies that can play on the inside of that offensive line. You yeah. know, we can cook a little bit now. Yeah, absolutely. Coach Lynn in the chat says Barton is what Goot wanted Myers to be. LOL. Uh, I think that's a pretty fair <laughs> so assessment true. there. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Brock in the chat says Barton at center and Cooper BB at right guard. So let's climb down here and see where Cooper BB's falling right now. Um, looks like Cooper DeGene is actually sitting at nine right now. Um, let's see here. As we come across uh, our boy, where's he at? There's Graham Barton. There's Jackson Powers Johnson at 24, Graham Barton at 25. This is PFF's uh, consent or their big board, basically. Okay. As we move on to the second page, you got. As far as offensive linemen, there's Tyler Gotten at tackle. So we're looking for Cooper Beebe, right? Let's see where he falls. I'm just trying to see where about he may be taken if this board were to be, you know, completely accurate. He's pretty far down the list. Seems like he has dropped a little bit here. Cooper Beebe from, I think, Kansas State. Is that right? Oh, uh, don't ask me. I'm bad at that. Man, he is. He must be way down the list. I'm going to have to sort it by position here at one point yeah, i felt like he was much higher than this but uh i am not seeing him here anywhere let's just do it let's waste no more time and and just go sort it by position cooper bb obviously a guard maybe we pass them up and i overlook him. there's christian haynes they got him as the top guard too the only difference is i've got christian haynes at the 30 spot they've got him at 64 
So my board is really big on him. There you go. Cooper BB at 126. 126. Okay. Yeah. So you'd be looking at him a little bit later there. Um, his 2023 grade, man, he was the fourth highest graded guard in all of college football. He was the 12th highest graded guard um, in, uh, obviously, in 2022. Look at him in 2021 as well, Tim. 22nd. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that dude. Wow, solid. I see what you're saying, Brock. You know, um, well, I wonder just what is what is keeping him from being higher? On my board, I've got him in the 37th spot. The fact that PFF has him at 126 with with him just absolutely killing their grades, it's just strange, it's really strange. Um, 6'4", 335, he's 22 years old. He'll be 23 this coming season. Um, yeah, I've got him in the 37th spot. I'd be totally cool with that too, you know. Get Barton at center, put Cooper BB at, at right guard. If you can get him, say, in the third round or something, I'd be all right with that. We got to remember, though, that, you know, Josh is in a contract year here. So, I mean, it's really his job to lose um, – you know, I, I I just don't want to count on them taking a center super early. I can see them going interior O line early, um, mm -hmm. but I don't. I don't know if I want to get too too excited. But I agree with that. That would be amazing, right? Because that basically kind of gives you, you know, I'm not going to say a leg up, but it puts you puts a a foot in the right direction, a step forward in the right direction on the inside of your offensive line. And yeah. then you've got, like I said, you got Big E and you got Zach Tom you know, that provides some good anchors there and you can, you can mix this young talent in there and see what happens as you go. But um, yeah, I don't know. Other than the, other than defense, offensive line is, is crucial, right. You know, for this team to get over the hump and bring Lombardi home, you know, like coach Len was saying, right. You got to get it done in the trenches. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so turtles in the chat says Fuaga is better. If you're talking about them Barton, absolutely, man. I mean, everything about him screams that he's the 12th ranked offensive lineman, according to PFF. I've got Fuaga as the second best uh, best uh, offensive lineman. Twelfth overall is what PFF's got him. They got him as the second best offensive lineman too. Again, they've got him. They've got him in the twelve spot. I've actually got Fuaga in the seven spot. Where's the uh, Mims at right now? Amarius Mims. Amarius Mims. Let's check that real quick. Amarius Mims. Curious. Oh, 20, there he is. Twenty-two. Yeah. Okay. Six seven three four. I can't get over that six. Foot seven, three hundred and forty pounds, man. Swallow. Let's, put, let's grab him and stick him out there with Caleb Jones. Just two big towers out there <laughs> on that line. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got Amarius Mims in the twenty-two spot. They've got him in twenty-two. So mine matches up right, right there along PFFs for sure when it comes to Amarius Mims. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's where he sits. Let's see what else is going on here in the chat. Doug Pointer, Barton is one of the guys. I would pull the trigger at 25 or above as he will be a 10 to 12 year Packer, otherwise cornerback. Yeah. Some of the longevity we're talking about here. And, you know, when I say Joe Thomas too, again, I'm not saying that Graham Barton is a slam dunk hall of famer. I'm just saying when you look at how he's built, how he moves, how he carries himself, that's who it reminds me of. Right. Um, if there's anyone in this draft that has the best opportunity to be a first ballot hall of famer, or, you know, like Joe Thomas, it's this guy right here, Joe Walt. Like, that dude is a stud. 6'8", 322. Look at those grades, Tim. Third best tackle, according to PFF. Second best tackle, according to PFF. Measurables just off the freaking charts, too. He's uh, he Notre Dame, so we know you love him, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what logo would be next to that dude's name. <laughs> but it doesn't say, hurt, right? <laughs> it, it sure doesn't. It don't hurt at all. If anything, I wish he'd drop a little bit. So it's <laughs> yeah, he's going he's gonna to be the first offensive lineman taken. There's no doubt about that in my eyes, man. I don't see how anyone can pass up on him um, early in the first. Like I said, that's another thing we talked about. Maybe a team trades up to try to to try to swoop in and get um, try to swoop in and get uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. from the Cardinals. There could be somebody with Joe Alt on there. You know what I mean? That yep. they would want to trade up before someone takes Joe Alt at tackle. That's another thing that could really kind of drive the draft as well. Um, let's see. Uh, John Smith in the chat said, "Quickness in O line is nice. One reason why Kelsey was great um, can get to those downfield blocks." Others can't. Kelsey just played with such, such control, such balance. You know, it's when you hear Mike Wall talk about how you arrive at confrontation determines how you handle confrontation. You think Jason Kelsey, that dude was just when he got to that safety downfield, 
you could tell the safety was like, this dude has got me. Like he, before you even made contact with him, he was zeroed in on him like a cat. Um, I really, really liked watching Jason Kelsey play for sure. Uh, Prince in the chat said left tackle, most important position on O-line need to address early to backstop um, Walker. Yeah. And if you unseat him, then you've got arguably the best backup left tackle in the game in Walker. Right. right? So it's another good point. J. Cole, go Barton, a cornerback at 41 trade up from 58 for Edron Cooper. Let's look at Edron Cooper because I'm in, I'm in the extreme minority when it comes to Edron Cooper, Tim. Um, on my board, uh, I've got Edron Cooper as it sits right now. I've got him as the fifth best linebacker on my board. I've got Junior Colson, Peyton Wilson, Cedric Gray, Jeremiah Trotter Jr., then Edron Cooper. But hmm. every, I mean, everyone else has got Edron Cooper hands down the best linebacker in the draft. I'm going to pull up linebackers here real quick, according to PFF. And let's just kind of see here. Now, see, they got Peyton Wilson significantly higher than Edron Cooper, like uh, to the tune of almost 40 spots higher. Um, when you look at Edron Cooper's PFF grades, this is the thing that got me. Um, 2021, he was a 64.1. 2022, he was a 66.1. And then all of a sudden, he just, bang, he jumps to a 90.8. You know, it's which is the norm, you know? what If if he reverts back to playing in that 66 range and you take him as a top linebacker in the draft, that's it's a big miss there, right? Especially when you've got someone like a Peyton Wilt. Like, if you remove the names, let's do it this way. If you remove the names and you've just looked at the grades, right, who would you be more excited about there? You would probably be more excited about Edron Cooper. You really yeah. would, right? Over Peyton Wilson. But when you look at the Peyton Wilson's measurables, right, from the combine, which you guys know how I feel about that. I don't think it's as important as most people do. Um, he just jumps off the freaking page, right? Um, on top of that, Peyton Wilson got some injury history too. But again, PFF kind of going against their grades just a touch and putting what Peyton Wilson significantly higher. Now, when you look at Junior Colson, compare Edron Cooper and Junior Colson here. Obviously, the 48 on 521 snaps, that's ugly. Then he jumps to a 75.5, right? Then goes to 81.7. So you see a significant increase, the steady increase every year, as opposed to 64, 66, then bang a 90, right, with Edron mm-hmm. Cooper. Um, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. is the one, though. If, if he was six foot two, I think it's the best linebacker in the draft. I believe that. That's really the biggest knock on him, right? It's just the size. The only thing I can find, man. It's the only thing I can find. Yeah. So, um, 2021, 71.4. 2022, talking about Jeremiah Trotter Jr., 86.9. And then in 2023, 85.7. Someone's going to get one hell of a linebacker. And it's probably going to happen, you know, three or four linebacker picks into the draft. That's what it kind of seems like there. So uh, I really like that pick that I was able to nab Jeremiah Trotter Jr. a little later. Um, I was okay with missing on Junior Colson at the time. So, um, yeah, that's how that sits. And, again, Junior Colson, I've got him as my top linebacker. And I think a big part of that, too, if I remember correctly, was actually the consensus big board. Uh, and, again, I got Junior Colson in the 50 spot. Yeah, the consensus big board early on had him um, in the 85 spot. And the big outlier here, the big thing, is the 33rd team has him as the 35th best prospect when I compiled that data, right? And then Daniel Jeremiah has him at number 45. So that's kind of how that falls into place. Let's see what Daniel Jeremiah had to say about Edron Cooper. So he had Edron Cooper in the 20 spot, but the 33rd team has Edron Cooper at 126. Hmm. So the big thing that hurts Edron Cooper on my board is the 2022 PFF grade and the 33rd team's grading of him. That's the big thing that knocked him. But, yeah, so Daniel Jeremiah definitely sees Edron Cooper as a significantly better linebacker there, no doubt about it. Um, I got a couple in the chat from uh, Deadfish if you want to pull them up. Go right ahead, buddy. You pull them up, man. He's just asking about uh, is Jeremiah uh, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. a Mike linebacker Mm -hmm. and also – you know, kind of hand in hand, who's the best Mike in this draft? Do you think right yeah. now? It's a great question. And it depends on who you ask that fish. <laughs> Everybody's got their own opinions, right? Um, you know, according to PFF, you'd have to go to the, you'd have to go to the grades, right? Like the, the weekly grades and to see where they actually lined up at. Um, I don't think I can get to it 
from this screen. I might be able to right here. This this may throw us completely off here. Yeah, it's going to open a separate window. Okay. Um, I, sorry, I'm going to try it though. Let's see if we can go by position. Uh, no, let's go by team. Let's go by team, and it was Clemson, right? So let's go Clemson, and then we'll try to find Jeremiah Trotter Jr. Uh, just the regular season, we'll key in on that. And let's go with uh, defensive grades. If I can find it here, yeah, it's all. It's going to take forever to try to filter through this. That's going to be darn near impossible. The big thing about Mike, really, what you've got is Mike and Will. You know, Sam. People talk about Sam backers like they're really common. Like, oh, this guy's going to get up on the line of scrimmage. He's going to, he's going to basically act as an edge, but he can also drop into into coverage. You just don't see that that often with these Halfley style defenses. Like, and what I mean by that is the Jets, when you looked at the tape and we pulled it up, Tim, we showed it here on Chalk Talk that one day. When you look at the Jets linebackers, they had three stacked backers playing back, right? They used a four-man rush and they had three stacked backers. San Francisco did the same exact thing. You didn't see that like traditional Sam. So when you break it down to a mock and a wheel, what it comes down to is your mock has to be able to play in two different directions He's got to have really good gap integrity. Your wheel backer is more of that athletic backer that's going to be able to chase down the cutbacks off the strong side, right? So he's playing on that weak side. He's typically more athletic, but if you go to San Francisco, Fred Warner played Mike, right? And that's what we really got to go off of. New York Jets and the San Francisco 49ers. The San Francisco 49ers, when you think Mike linebacker, you think Fred Warner. He's arguably the best Mike linebacker in the league. If you go to the Jets, you think C.J. Mosley. So when you look at Jeremiah Trotter Jr., you don't see him kind of playing that type of fit. He's significantly shorter. In both of those defenses, all the mocks reached at least six foot two, right? So that's kind of ideal. So he's significantly shorter. And you could see the wheel backer in both of those defenses were significantly shorter. For example, uh, Quentin Williams, right? Quentin's brother. I think it was, I think his name was Quint, no Quincy Williams. Quincy Williams, Quentin Williams' his brother, who plays Will Linebacker for the Jets, he's 5'11, right? So to answer your question, I think that um Jeremiah Trotter Jr. would be more of a Will than a Mike. So when you look at it from a standpoint like that, as yeah, we have backed completely out now. This is absolutely lovely. <laughs> Go back into the backers here. Um, at least we got a NASA computer to get us back there quick. Damn, look so, at that. Let's look at the height, okay, to answer your question here, Deb Fish. Peyton Wilson, again, what was the big thing on him according to the 33rd team scouting report on Peyton Wilson? High football IQ, crazy athleticism. That suggests can play in both directions, right? With your Will and your Sam backers, and there's still a Sam even though they're not mugging the line of scrimmage, right? It's still a strong side backer. That's referred to as a Sam. Um your mock backer needs to be able to play, you know, sideline to sideline. He's got to be able to read and recognize, got to have a high football IQ. That sounds like Peyton Wilson. So in this draft, it sounds like Peyton Wilson might be the, the best mock. He's six foot four, more than exceeds that height that you need, right? Edger and Cooper, six three. You've got the height there, right? Yeah. Um, Junior Colson, six foot three. You've got the height there. Doesn't mean they won't play Will, right? But you definitely got the height there. Um, my guess is if the Packers find themselves in a situation where they're going to draft a linebacker, if it's Peyton Wilson, Edron Cooper, or Junior Colson, there's a significant chance they could play mock, right? Uh, Peyton Wilson, I think, is a slam dunk to play a mock. I can see them keeping Quay at mock and playing an Edron Cooper or a Junior Colson as the will. I can see that in the nickel set. But if you draft Jeremiah Trotter Jr., probably just going to be a will, you know? Right. When you look, when you move down to to Laufau, um, six two, he kind of meets the requirements. Tommy Eichenberg meets the requirements. Cedric Gray, who we took later, meets the requirements for a mock. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to play mock. So I think that, according to the scouting reports, read and recognition, what they call FBI football IQ, Peyton Wilson's probably the best mock in this draft. That's kind of what it feels like on the surface. Now, you get them in the camp though, Tim. Throw the playbook at them and people separate themselves. You never know. Junior Colson or Edron Cooper might just emerge, you know, with way more football intelligence than Quay Walker and they pop him into the mock, you know, could, could happen. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and you see some of these other linebackers, JD Bertrand, as you get later, 6'1, 6'1. These are kind of wheels. They feel like wheels. 
Um, Jalen Ford could potentially be a mock, but you get that late in the draft, you're not trusting them to be the quarterback of your defense. That's the other thing to take into consideration, too. Like, you could tell last year, I was kind of surprised by it. Even when Devondre Campbell was healthy, they kind of just kept the green dot on Quay and let him play mock, and they moved Devondre around a little bit. It feels like they want Quay to be a mock. It really feels like that. Now, athletically, obviously, Quay's an athletic freak. He kind of fits the athletic profile from a – uh, from a talent standpoint, as a will backer, let him play free. Because what you do with a will and a Sam is they're just playing half the field, right? They're playing their half, and they can play fast. That mock's got to be able to play both sides, both sides constantly. So, what do you think? So, uh, thought or what do you think about um, Zay McDuffie at the mic? Like Cody's saying here, he thinks McDuffie's probably the best mic fit right now. Mm. I don't know if I'd go that far, but I don't think I'd. I, it's not that crazy to see McDuffie as a mic, right? I mean, he'd be on the smaller end though, or shorter end, much like we were saying about uh, Trotter Jr., right? Yeah. I think McDuffie's if, like 6'1", six, 6'1", six six, six something like that. I'm going to pull him up right now. That's a great question. I'd like to know that too. Um, let me see if I can get to the roster here real quick and find that for y'all. Um, on the surface, let me ask you this. Who do you see wearing the green dot, Quay Walker or Isaiah McDuffie? Because I kind of well, see Quay. You know? Yeah. So that, sure. to me, on the surface, and again, that's a, just a very, you know, very surface answer there, but uh, it kind of feels like Quay would edge him out over the mic. But let's go to McDuffie real quick, and uh, let me see if I can get it on screen for you guys so you can see. Well, I'll just read it off. That way we can keep the draft information up. Um, when you go to his weekly grades here, I think I can pull up his weekly. God, man, I don't know why they do it like this. crazy. They, uh, they make you kind of start from scratch after you already had him pulled up here. I want to see his weekly because that's where it shows where he lined up. So, looky here, Tim. Holy cow. Uh, last year, played in week one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, obviously a bye in eight. He played in every game this year other than week 13 and week eight, whichever one of those is the bye and the other isn't. Played in every game. Total snaps, you know, 19, two. 37, 46, 60, 39, 54, 58, 20, 71, 40, 50, 15, 16, and 24. He played mock 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 of those, 11 of those games. He played Will. Um, what would that leave us? 1, 2, 3, yeah, three different games he played Will. So he was technically the mock not wearing the green dot. So I don't know who asked that question. I can't, I can't remember who asked the question, but uh, whoever did, there you go, man. That's a great question. Um, good information there too. Even though he technically wasn't lining up as the mock in those situations, obviously Quay was on the field the majority of the time, if I remember correctly. With Quay on the field, Quay's wearing a green dot, but he was technically playing Will. And right. they were kind of putting McDuffie probably more on the strong side in nickel sets, and PFF refers to them – as will typically, right? But technically, it would be a will backer with that's where you get into kind of splitting hairs, too, man. You yeah. know, and we've also cleaned house on our defensive staff, too. So we could see a lot of changes here with, you know, green dot assignment and Mike versus Will. You know, that's, who knows what Halfley's got up his sleeve, you know? That's why I find myself looking at the Jets and the 49ers going, what's this going to look like? You know, what exactly is this going to look like? Yep. So let's see here. Uh, Coach Lynn said McDuffie with the green dot would allow Quay to just play fast and not think so much. And and Coach Lynn, many people are saying that too. Just put Quay on the weak side and let him eat. Just let him play free, right? Um, even better if you do have a Peyton Wilson or someone fall in your lap, throw the green dot on him and Quay can play. And now you've got a couple of physical freaks out there, right? I mean, yeah, Peyton yeah. Wilson, what he did at the combine, it is impressive. It is. I just try not to fall in love with that stuff, and that's why I don't let it allow it to affect my board. But even with that not affecting my board, I've got Peyton Wilson as the 63rd best prospect. Obviously, PFF sees him a lot higher. Um, let's see here. Joseph in the chat said, Dre made McDuffie look better than he was last year. I like having him as a depth, a depth, a depth piece. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how the defense plays without Dre because Dre made it sound like on his way out it was everyone else's fault. He's the only – anytime something went right, it was it was his doing. That really disappointed me because I always liked Dre. 
Um, yeah, it was just weird, man. It, like some of the comments he made, not you guys know on the pod, I tried to steer clear of it, but it was just constantly, you know, like that whole barrage of tweets he put out was the only reason I won all, or first of all, when he won all pro in 2021 under Joe Barry, he said, the scheme finally used me the way they should. Everywhere I've played, they haven't used me the right way. And then when he takes a step back, it's they're not using me the right way. <laughs> right. And then when you point out, well, the tape is showing this. Someone on Twitter did that. Oh, that's because J.O. didn't play didn't play the right spot. It's like he literally threw the front office under the bus, Jonathan Owens under the bus, uh, Joe Barry under the bus, the Atlanta Falcons under the bus, the uh, Arizona Cardinals under the bus. It was just everybody. Anytime something's went right, it's because of me. And anytime something went wrong, it's because of someone else. Is basically what he was saying. It was just disappointing. Yeah, I really like Dre, but I know Brian Bulaga. Whoo, he went off on the Homer Hour. He was just—I mean, you don't hear you don't hear Brian Bulaga get upset very often. He was really disappointed. Like, what in the world are you talking about, dude? This is this is as bad as it gets. And now it's time to put up or shut up. You're going to see what he can do in San Francisco, right? Is he going to blame them if it goes bad? <laughs> yeah. Good luck with that in that linebacker room out there, yeah. right? Could you imagine him pointing fingers at Fred Warner? <laughs> okay. yeah, that'll, that'll go over real well good luck with that um that's an interesting take there coach lynn says mckinney with the green dot um from the back end of the d huh okay I would, I would love to know if anyone in the last five years other than a, other than a linebacker has wore the green dot i'd love to know the answer to that question i think it's a no but i could be wrong you know, I'm so caught up in the Packers, I really don't look around the league at all those little details, right? So, uh, you think that would be pretty tough uh, for the last minute communication, right? Mm-hmm. Like adjustments from from the back end of the defense, like that. I mean, yeah. usually being you know in the middle, you can adjust the line, you can look over your shoulder at your secondary and make adjustments or calls. I think it'd be really hard for McKinney to get a call into. Uh, Kenny Clark or something on a play from the back of the defense. Yeah, definitely. Mark Zambito in the chat says McDuffie played for Halfley. That's another great point. You know, just like Halfley comes in and sees Keyshawn Nixon on the tape and said, Hey, I like him as my slot corner. He may have said, Hey, yeah, Duff's my guy. Tim, wouldn't it be hilarious if we go through this entire draft, we don't draft one linebacker and it's just Quay and McDuffie this whole time. <laughs> like Eric Wilson kind of playing the other linebacker position, pick up an undrafted free agent or two, roll them on and off the practice squad, and you kind of got Christian Welch there to help with free ag- or with uh, free agency, with special teams. Of course that would happen, right, after right. we're sitting here and talking about all these linebackers. That would line up with my feeling that uh, this is the year that Quay is going to pop, you know. Thir- year three, I think he's going to make that leap, you know. Yeah, I really do. And if and if you get that, if we get that monster leap from Quay Walker here, um, that's going to make things real interesting in the middle. You know, certain like you said, once camp starts, man, roles roles start to define themselves based on work, based on you know how you're learning this new system with with Halfley here. Um, you know who's grasping these concepts quicker and who's executing. And you know Quay's been here a couple years. I'm sure a lot of the guys that have been here. Um, are looking forward to, uh, you know, a new look defensively. And maybe, uh, maybe you know, maybe there's some truths in there with what Dre was saying about, you know, personnel decisions and things like that on defense and that some guys weren't being utilized to their uh, best potential, put it that way, uh, as we see Darnell Savage go to <laughs> Jacksonville and immediately become a slot, right? And And we spoke for years about putting Darnell in the slot possibly. Uh, right. to address that issue and it never happened. So um, there could be some truth in there, but I'm just looking forward to see what, you know, camp is going to be put up or shut up time and go out there and win that, win that role that you want in this defense. So uh, all eyes on Quay Walker, man, he's the X factor uh, when it comes to the middle. Yeah, definitely. John Smith in the chat says, wow, crazy Devin White signed for one year, seven and a half million. Just looking at free agent linebackers right now. Yeah. I, I was never, what? I was never big on Devin White though. Like he, I feel like he underperformed so bad. Um, John, I, I'm not Seven accusing half you, Millie though. Yeah, I'm not accusing you of this, John. Okay, but many people, I think, 
look at the Madden grades and they go, Devin Watts a stud because they got him ranked really high according to what people were talking about because I've seen the Madden screenshots and everything. If you go to PFF, and this is kind of how I've always seen Devin Watt, he, he's, he's very, very – um, physically talented, I guess you could say. He's six foot two thirty seven, so he doesn't have that ideal height. He was the fifth overall selection. Here are his PFF grades since he's been in the league. 51, 48, 35, 43, and 47. Like I, I pause for dramatic effect. And again, yeah. I just don't I don't look at him and go, man, that's that's a Fred Warner type, right? And and obviously seven and a half million, and I think it was Philly that signed him for that. I think you really overpaid there. I really did. overpaid for good, right? You don't want to over right. you want overpay for great, but not not overpaying for good, right? I I get it. Exactly. exactly. I was just thinking, kind of like he was someone who was on my radar, even when we were talking about possibly bringing like a Bobby Wagner or somebody in as kind of mm-hmm. just a, some patchwork here for a, for a year. Um. So I mean, best of luck in Philly, right? You know, yeah. there's thing everything happens or doesn't happen for a reason. So I can't wait to see who ends up uh, in the middle here for us. Definitely. Joseph in the chat says, I haven't heard you uh, you all talk about Darius Robinson when I've been on. What's your ranking? He's a freak of nature, can play up and down the line and standing or hand in the dirt. Um, he's one of those guys that uh, I remember Jake talking about. Everyone flipped out at the senior bowl. Like he impressed the heck out of everyone. Someone actually mentioned that he had the same measurables as J.J. Watt. Like everyone was comparing him to J.J. Watt. Now, some people see him as an edge, a a big body edge. Other people see him as a defensive lineman, like an interior defensive lineman. This will be our last question. We'll get out of here. Um, Let me tell you where I've got Darius Robinson because I'm not as big on him as most people. Um, Let me see if I can find him. It should be in the green on my board here. Surely he ain't there. If he's that low, that's absolutely wild. Um, where is he at? Now nah, he can't be that low. I'm down in the two hundreds. Let me start over. Give me just. <laughs> I'm glad you asked this question because I'm I'm eager to see where he falls um, on my board. It's just this spreadsheet is so small, man. It's a uh, there we go. I've got him in the forty six spot. I was going to say he has to be top 100. Yeah. I've got him in the 46 spot, and I've got him – he's listed as an edge on my board, but like I said, he can play on the interior as well. I think people kind of see him as that J.J. Watt. You could you could put him out there in a seven-tech, and you can also squeeze him in on a three-tech type guy. Um, but, you know, ideally probably put him in a 4-3 defense to play him off the edge. Now, when you look at our 4-3 defense, you got Lucas Van Ness, you got Rashawn Gary, you got Preston Smith. You kind of feel like – you would want to play him on the interior to maximize what you get there, Joseph. But, uh, again, yeah, I've got him in the 46 spot. Um, let's see where PFF's got him real quick since we're already on the subject here. Go to the linebackers. We'll exit that off. I'm sure they've got him as an edge as well. We go to edge defender. They have Darius Robinson in the 44 spot, so just two spots higher than I do. Um, you see significant increase when you look at the grades, 68, 77, 83. Six foot five, two ninety six. Not an ounce of fat on him, dude. He's just built like a Mack truck. There's no doubt about it. Um, so that's where he sits currently, according to PFF, and according to uh, to my big board as well. There at forty six. Um, yeah. And as far as how I got him at the forty six spot, he graded out as the hundred and seventh best edge defender um, in twenty twenty two. In 2023, I think he was 51st. When I compiled the data, keep in mind, this is before the Senior Bowl. This was before, it might have been actually right after the Senior Bowl, but the consensus big board hadn't adjusted yet. This is definitely pre-combine, and I did that on purpose, obviously. He was in the 118 spot. So since we got the measurables, he skyrocketed, right? So he went from 118 to wherever he's sitting on the consensus big board now. And the 33rd team has him in the 42 spot right, which kind of checks out with where we've got him at. And Daniel Jeremiah has him in the 32 spot. So 10 spots higher, uh, 12 spots higher, four, uh, 14 spots higher than where I've got him. So um, he checks out. For the out record, I love, I love what's going on right now on the screen. Uh, Adisa Isaac, Darius Robinson, Chop Robinson. <laughs> you can never have those him. names. I'll be, I'll be happy. Yeah. And that was one of the, one of the people in the PTA posse, uh, 
here on our um on our chat that we've got the patreon chat's really cool man um i'm excited about everybody jumping in there um because it's easy to kind of keep that conversation going i want to give credit here it was cjn the user cjn um member of the posse there on patreon um his guy that he wanted to see more of was a, a Deza isaac from penn yeah. state so that was kind of one of his guys. Let me scroll down just a touch so you can get a little bit better look at him. Uh, 6'4", 254, 63 PFF in 2022, jumped all the way to 81. You see a big increase there. He's only 22 years old. Um, I think I've got him higher than Darius Robinson, I believe, maybe on my board. Let me see if I can find him real quick. I feel like I had a pretty good grade on him. Um, at these eyes. Now he must be a little bit lower. Um, let's see if we could find him real quick, and then we will honestly for for sure. I thought you really were in the sixties or seventies. I could maybe. Be wrong. And he may have dropped here recently. Everybody's shifting around as I'm putting the rest of the information in. Where is he at, man? Yeah, I thought <laughs> I thought he would be in the top fifty. Man, I'm getting old, Tim. These spreadsheets. There he is. He's actually significantly lower. I've got him at one forty two. Holy cow! Now you okay. know why? Ask me why, Tim. <laughs> why, so, Clay? 606 in 2022, he graded out as the 606. You see it right there on the screen, 606th edge defender, right? That's significantly lower than obviously he jumped up there to 67. Um, the consensus big board had him at 63. Uh, the uh, 33rd team has him in the 50 spot. So the only thing that's dragging him down on my board is that, that you know, r- pretty bad 2022, right? Took a big step. My board is very conservative in that regard. Like, I, I need to see multiple years for you to be like a slam dunk top of the you know top yeah. of the board guy. It doesn't mean you're not going to be a great pro. He could be one. Know. He could be one of those players though, Clayton. That depending on where he gets picked and where he ends up playing his first couple of years could really impact the type of pro that he he becomes. You know, if he yeah. ends up in a in the wrong system somewhere. You know. He looks like a guy on the rise if you're just looking at the numbers, right? Took a big leap last year. You get him in a good system with a good DC and uh, develop him, you know, he could have a great career or he could be someone we're not even talking about a couple years from now. You never know. Yeah, we're going to find out, though. And he is a red shirt senior, too. Still only 22 years old. He'll be 23 this coming football season. Got two more chats here. We'll get out to him. Uh, Doug Pointer says Clayton sold me a little on Trotter being surrounded by football his whole life and being very instinctive and educated at the position. That's and it's like the PFF grades, Doug. They they kind of line up with that. You see him, he's steady the last two years, he being Jeremiah Trotter Jr. Um, obviously being around his dad playing football at the pro level. I'm sure you've seen firsthand what it takes to be a pro, right? I think that stuff matters to me personally. It's one of the reasons why I'm so hesitant on Caleb Williams. I could care less about the nail polish and all the flamboyant. I could care less about that stuff. But when you look at, you know, what he's done, how he carries himself, his dad in the background, they're saying he's kind of likes to be involved. And it's just like, this feels kind of like he's either going to be a slam dunk top five quarterback for the next or 10 years. Marcus Russell all over again. Exactly. <laughs> that, it's kind of, you know, people forget about Jamarcus Russell. That dude was throwing, what was it, 75 yards from his knees? Yep. And everybody's like, oh, this arm, ta- arm talent, arm talent, arm talent. Next thing you know, that dude's out of the league. Bro. They disguised one coverage on him, and we saw the truth. <laughs> and, and that's the big thing about, you know, the positive, the positive on Caleb Williams is he can play off schedule. When things break down, man, he can make magic happen. The negative yeah. is he hardly ever plays on time. You hardly ever see him three-step drop, let it rip. You read the defense, know exactly where we're going with the ball. He's always looking for that deep shot. Ryan's pod the other day really opened a lot of eyes, I'm sure, because he broke it down. Like There were multiple, multiple quarterbacks last year that was ahead of Caleb Williams in every statistical category. Now, granted, it's just one year. He won the Heisman the year before. But, again, when you see him, what makes you think he's that guy? It's the off-schedule stuff, throwing off the back foot, you know, just making, making magic happen. It's a little harder to do that in the NFL. It really is. You've got Especially to play on with the Bears, too. <laughs> you better be able to play off schedule with the Bears because you're going to be <laughs> running. I promise you that. Um, final one here, Dead Fish in the chat. said, Clayton and Tim, thanks for answering my question. Seems like Quay plays the will. Draft uh, Peyton Wilson, Edron Cooper, or Colson to play the mic. Then who plays the Sam? That will uh, be off the field in nickel. 
yeah, I, I think that's a pretty fair assessment, right? Um, we'll see how uh, how it all shakes out, man. Draft's going to be a blast. I know that. I can't wait for it to get here, dude. It's we could see linebacker by committee too, for all we know. They could just stack. They could just load up and and see how camp goes. And yeah, we know we've got a couple consistent names there, but I mean, they could be plugging and playing left and right and in the middle. Yeah, definitely. Chris Nye in the chat says, uh, well, thank you, Clayton. Glad you like my choice on Patreon. See, I'm trying to figure out who is who. Like, that's CJN, obviously, on Patreon. So I'm trying to figure out. Everybody's got different names. they got a different Twitter name from their YouTube name, from their Patreon name. So. Who? Exactly. I can't even remember my dog's name, much less three different names for each person that we communicate with. But, yeah, I like that format that we're using, too, man, for sure. So, uh yeah, see, AFAM trying to get trouble started. He said Clayton gives him a negative grade for the nail polish. And you, AFAM. No, nah, dude, I could care less. Now, listen, do I think it's a positive? I don't because it draws attention. And it doesn't matter what it is. Like, when you think of the great leaders in the history of the game, you don't think of guys that are, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. You know, first person I think of is Johnny Manziel, right? Yeah. You know, all he ever did is, you know, Money Manziel, right? I love that workout for him. Yeah. Exactly. It's just it just kind of feels like that, you know. Um, yeah, I, I like more of the Barry Sanders style of leadership. Yeah. You know, act like you've way. been there before, right? Yeah. Let me put it this way: the Bears pretty much being a slam dunk to take Caleb Williams. The more time goes on, if you'd asked me a month ago, I'd be going, "Man, this sucks." They're getting a heck of a talent. The more that time goes on, he keeps drawing attention to himself and everything. I find myself going. I like the way this is working out. <laughs> I really do. You've already got two teammates that stepped out and spoke out on him. Yeah. Like Jalen Johnson, who they just threw the book at, right? They just signed him to a long – didn't they – I know they franchise tagged him, but I think they ended up working out a long-term deal, like a four-year deal. He said, don't bring that Hollywood into the locker room. Yep. So you've got these people on Twitter, these podcasters on Twitter, that are like, oh, this doesn't matter. You're being a bigot. You're being this. It's like, no, you've already got people in the locker room going, hey, leave that stuff out of here. That's what we're talking about. Yep. That's what we're talking about, about the locker room. And it's and any knocks that we're addressing on on him or any other player is the play, not not him as a person. You Absolutely. Know, we're talking about football here. Yep. You know, if you're worried about fingernail polish, you're not you're not thinking about football. Yeah. And AFAM was joking, by the way. No, he, yeah, for yeah, sure. He, he for was sure. telling me cheek, him trying to put me on the spot there. He knows what he's doing there. He sees Twitter <laughs> right now. So, um, yeah. But uh, <laughs> he's uh, he's going off in the chat. All right, we're done here. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, Coach Lynn nailed it. I like the Jordan Love type leadership. Yep. Amen. That dude is just, again, even kill, quiet, a quiet leader. Teammates know he cares about him. It's not about him. It's about, hey, let's go win some freaking ball games. Let's keep it the light shine on the team. Anytime they do something good, you don't hear Jordan say, yeah, I seen this. I did this really well. It's always Aaron Jones picked up the block. He was shutting down Micah Parsons. You know, look at Jaden Reed. Jaden Reed's a dynamic. He always leadership 101, man. You absorb criticism and you redistribute praise. That's the way it works. And Jordan Love does that better than anybody, man. That's why I think he's going to get the bag, and I think he should, man. I'm excited about it, seeing that dude get paid and rewarded for uh, sitting for three years, waiting his turn, and then just coming in and absolutely lighting it up and doing it with class. So there you yep. go. Um, all right, I let's get out of here. Ten-year deal, Clayton. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of there with you, but I, I think what it's going to be is a three- to four-year deal. That's how good he operates, you know. Um, yeah. It'll probably be a four-year deal. And uh, if, it, if it comes in – less than 50 million per average. And, and again, the guaranteed money is the most important aspect to determine how you can move stuff around. But as far as cap hit, but if it comes in less than 50 million, Tim, what a team player, because yeah. what he did the second half of the season warrants top three, top five quarterback money. If he comes in less than 50 million, then I'm considering that. Listen, it's still a lot of money, but I'm considering that kind of a, Hey, that dude cares about building the team around him. Oh yeah. I think he wants, he wants, Lombardi home more than anything. And if, and, you know, if hey, that'll that'll get you a new deal, right? Yeah. Oh, bring, absolutely. Bring a Super Bowl home. Now, if he lands a 60 million per on average, I'm not going to sit here and go, Jordan loves selfish. You got to get what you got to get, man. That's yep. the business. You you guys have been around long enough to see. I kind of side with the players more than anything now. If you'd yep. ask the knucklehead Clayton 10 years ago, I'd be going, these selfish pricks. Yep. They need to play under. <laughs> and I was an idiot. I was a moron. 
So <laughs> you look at it from the player's perspective, you know, you got to see it from both sides. You really do. For so. sure. All right. We're out of here, Tim. You got anything else, Bob? Uh, no, I was just going to ask you. Uh, sure, who in the hell is Mel Kuyper in a way? We're going to continue to ask that until the draft gets there, I promise you. <laughs> Again, I want to give a quick shout out to our uh, Patreon members. We appreciate them uh, jumping on board. I've already exited out of the screen here, but uh, let me pull it back up real quick because we appreciate you uh, guys and gals supporting the show for sure. It's a cool little community that we're creating in there for sure. Um, let's see. We got uh, Joe Stadler, Doug Pointer, Ron Samville, and Allison Tuckwab. Um, joining as uh, PTA Posse members over on Patreon. Again, the uh, link is in the description. If you guys want to hop in there, that'll get you into uh, some of the giveaways. We're going to give away an autographed Paul Hunting jersey. Round one of the draft uh, there on Thursday night when we go live for the draft, we'll make sure we give that away about the halfway point. We're going to do some fun stuff and make it really, really interactive for you guys on the live draft. Watch, uh, watch along or what have you. So, yeah, with that being said, hope everybody has an awesome Easter. We'll probably be live at some point tomorrow. I'm not expecting Tim or anyone else to be on here with me. I'll let them know if I'm going to go live. And if you're free, you can hop on. It's totally cool. But I'm going to try to go live at least once tomorrow when I get a little bit of time. I think I got all the work done around the house. So we'll just be ready to grill out about, I don't know, about 75 pounds of hamburgers and hot dogs tomorrow. So we're just going to grill it up. Mandy talked me out of the ribs. She's like, Clayton, it's too much work. She's right. <laughs> Man, ain't nothing better than falling asleep on the couch with some barbecue sauce uh, stain on your shirt. You know what I'm saying, Tim? Family, you got 30 family members hanging out, and I'm snoring on the couch. It don't get no better than that. That's how you break in Easter right there. So, uh, but like I said, though, if you guys celebrate Easter, have a great Easter. And uh, if you're if you're not a Christian like us, then and you don't celebrate it, hey, you're welcome on this channel, man. Everybody's welcome, and uh, that's we're all about trying to create a a cool place where everybody can come and get along and learn together and all that good stuff as Packer fans. So we appreciate y'all just as much as we do uh, some of these heathen Christians out here. Locked up. So, but uh, everybody have a great night. Have a happy Easter. Appreciate everybody's time. For those of you listening on the pod, thank you for making us a part of it. Uh, as always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world. And go Pack Go. The power sweep. Actually, it's the it's the lead play in our in our offense. Yes, a YN or a tight end to open up somewhere between six feet and nine feet. Get an isolation with the with the linebacker. Come the tackle. Take the defensive end if he's over him. If he's not, he drives down on the first man to his inside. If the YN has the linebacker taken out, he cuts inside. If the YN has the linebacker here, he comes all the way around. If you look at this play, we're trying to get him to seal here and a seal here and try to run this